So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the interim director of, of NITEX. Uh, today, um, it is our pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Martin Weig. Uh, Martin uh, studied, um, did his BSc and his MSc at University of Stellenbosch. And in 2008, he obtained his PhD in mathematics uh, from the University uh, of Cape Town. <clears throat> he, he's working on uh, uh, mainly on functional analysis and, and surroundings. <laughs> yeah, but he will tell us something about his, uh, uh, his research in a second. Yeah? Uh, at the moment, uh, Martin is, um, is at the Nelson Mandela University in the, in the mathematics uh, department or faculty, I'm not sure. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> and, and today he will speak uh, about a topic uh, that stretches from, uh, from maybe from, from mathematics to, to quantum mechanics. <laughs> so Martin, we are very happy that, uh, that you're with us uh, this afternoon and we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Before I ask you to, to start, sorry, I always forget. Uh, just a reminder to the participants to, to use the Q&A facility to ask questions and uh, uh, Professor Sinaiski and myself will monitor it and, uh, and channel the questions to Martin uh, during, if it is urgent or after the talk, if it's not so urgent. But anyway, since we are not so many uh, after the talk, you're most than welcome to raise your hand and we will give you the right to ask your questions in, uh, in person. So uh, Martin, sorry, this is the, the, the long preliminaries. <laughs> now you're welcome to, to, to start your, with your presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, before I start, um, I just want to wish to thank you very, very much for um, allowing me the opportunity to give to give this presentation this afternoon. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, all right. So um, I'm Martin Weick from the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics of Nelson Mandela University. Um, my main research area is in functional analysis. Uh, namely in operator algebras, that's the C star algebras for Neumann algebras, and also I work a lot in uh, topological algebras and um, algebras consisting of unbounded operators, and then also with applications to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. All right, um, before I begin, um, I've tried to prepare this talk uh, for a diverse audience. Uh, as I understand, we all come from um, diverse backgrounds. So I'm trying to, to aim the talk at, um, at a non-specialist general audience. So um, what I'm first going to do is to maybe run you through some basics, some basic concepts in mathematics, maybe which some of you might have seen in your undergraduate analysis, and, um, be, and then we'll get down to business uh, with, with everything. Okay, so um, the first thing is um, what I'm talking about this afternoon has already been published um, in a paper, uh, which is Positivity and Applications. So uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll first focus everything on generalized B star algebras. I'll talk about this alone, and then I'll talk about the applications to, to, to quantum mechanics, especially the uh, quantum entanglement. So then if you want to, um, th this talk is going to be a very quick summary um, of what was covered in this paper. So um, if you want to go and read more about it afterwards, then you're welcome to consult the paper. And I can send you a copy thereafter if you are interested. Okay, um, first of all, in case, again, um, I, I try to cater for a very for a very diverse audience and to a non-specialist audience. So I'll run you through these basics quickly. Um, first of all, a metric uh, one of the first of all the preliminaries, um, a metric space is just a pair, a set X uh, with a distance function defined on X. So that will be on the Cartesian product of X into the reals, which have the following properties. So um, that's if that's, for example, where the distance function is always non-negative for every x and y, 
and the distance between two points x and y is zero precisely when x is equal to y. So we, we, we refer to D as a metric. And of course, the distance from x to y is, is we, we think of as the same as the distance from y to x. And then lastly, also the triangle type inequality that we have, that if you take any z, the distance from x to z and then from z to y will always be larger or equal to the distance from x to y. All right, um, so that, that's just a brief intro to a metric space. And then um, we will say that if you take a sequence within a metric space, it will be a Cauchy sequence um, if the distance between Xn and Xm converges to zero um, as N and M goes to infinity. And then a metric space is said to be complete um, if every Cauchy sequence in X Converges to an element of X with respect to the matrix to the matrix to the metric D. Okay, so th that's the idea of a complete space. And then a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is something I'm going to be using every every now and then. Um, it's an inner product space, uh, which is actually complete with respect to the metric D induced by the norm. So every so the, the the inner product on a Hilbert space, as we know, um, induces a norm on the set, and then using the norm, we can then define a metric. And then if the Hilbert space is complete with respect to this metric, so complete in this in terms of the second bullet, then we call it a Hilbert space. And uh, Hilbert spaces can generally be infinite dimensional. If the moment the Hilbert space is finite dimensional, then it's always complete. But in the infinite dimensional case, it need not be complete. Um, okay, in case you, you need a recap on that, um, just the, the idea of a topological space, you start with a set X, then a topology on X is a class of sets, which I denote with this calligraphic T here, such that first of all, the empty set and the whole set X are elements of T. And the union of any members of T is again a member of T. And then as far as intersections are concerned, only finitely many members of T is a member of T. Okay, so no, not any intersection of, mem of members of T is a member of T. It's only an intersection of finitely many members of T. But for a union, then you can just take any, any union of sets and that's a member of T. And then we will say that XT is a topological space. So X with the topology T. Also, um, very often we refer to the elements of T as open sets. We call them open sets, and then we call the complements in X of members of T closed sets. So closed sets are just complements of open sets within the set X. Um, every metric space is a topological space. And then also the idea of a topological vector space um, now what we do is previously um, our topology, topological space is just a set with no um, algebraic operations defined on it like addition or multiplication or anything like that. But now what do we do when we start combining some algebraic structure with it? So a topological vector space, this is a vector space equipped with a topology making addition and scalar multiplication continuous. And then a topological vector space, we'll call it Hausdorff, if for every X and Y and X, which are not equal, in other words, which are different, then you can get disjoint open sets U and V, so that X is in the one set U and Y is in the one set V, but U and V are disjoint. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, 
just want to activate my pen quickly. So what we then have is that U intersection V is empty. They're disjoint, but you have the X in U and the Y in V. So you can actually draw it then as a, as a Venn diagram. And then just briefly, what's an algebra? What do I mean by that? So that's any non-empty set on which we define binary operations of addition and multiplication, and then complex scalar multiplication. So the addition and the scalar, the complex scalar multiplication together uh, will form what we call a vector space. And now we have the additional structure of multiplication. Uh, we will always assume that our vector spaces and algebras are over the complex numbers. So our field is the complex numbers always. That's what we will assume here. So that's why I say especially complex scalar multiplication. And we will say that A is an algebra. So we have addition, multiplication, scalar multiplication. Then if it's a complex vector space with respect to addition and complex scalar multiplication. And then if A is a ring with respect to the same addition that we have here. But then also with regard to the multiplication. Which we, which we have previously. And then lastly, also with respect to scalar multiplication, we also have these nice properties um, that uh, the scalar multiplication then, um, that then commutes with the elements. Um, also, star algebra. A star algebra is any algebra A, um, but now equipped with one additional operation, which is a unary operation, um, having the following properties. And the unary operation, I'm going to indicate with a star. So that for all X and Y in the algebra and any, com and any complex scalar lambda, we necessarily have that if you take X plus Y all star, then you get X star plus Y star. Uh, if you take X, Y all star, then you get Y star X star. Um, our algebra is not necessarily assumed commutative. So um, this, is not this is not necessarily um, X star times Y star in general, not necessarily the case. And then if you take the star of lambda x, then you get uh, the you get the complex conjugate of lambda x star. And like, like, likewise, like, lastly, if you take the star of the star of x, you get x. Perhaps the easiest example of a star operation, or an in, this is often called also an involution, um, is actually when you take operators T in B of H, so those are all the bounded linear operators on a Hilbert space, and then you take the adjoint operator defined, um, defined for a bounded linear operator on a Hilbert space, and this is something which satisfies all four properties. And then, for example, MNC um, is an algebra with involution when the complex transpose is taken as involution, or generally just if you take the transpose in general in B of H. Um, some examples I'm going to give a little bit later on in this talk, especially where I'll emphasize in one case the involution. So uh, what I've done up until now is just to run through some, um, some preliminary concepts which I'm going to need. And now I'm going to start the business of talking about um, um, topological algebras and quantum mechanics. So first, uh, first of all, I want to just give a reminder of uh, von Neumann quantum mechanics. The first thing is, uh, is that observables such as position and momentum are represented as self-adjoint unbounded linear operators on a Hilbert space. So by an unbounded linear operator on a Hilbert space, we mean an operator um, which is densely defined and which maps into the Hilbert space. 
Um, in most cases, the operators need not be closed, but just generally closable. In other words, have a smallest closed extension. And then the states of a quantum system, they are represented by unit vectors in the Hilbert space having norm one. And the measurements of an observable, so that would be an observable operator in this case, those would be the eigenvalues of the Salford joint unbounded operator corresponding to the observable. Notice here that this does make sense. A Salford joint unbounded operator only has real eigenvalues um, and a real spectrum in general. So, the, so if, we, if we take the measurements, then of course we want it to be a real number. So that's why we take Salford joint operator here. And then the time dynamics of the system is going to be represented by, um, if, you take, if you take an operator A, how will it evolve over time? Then it's going to be evolving over time as when you just multiply on the left by E to the minus ITH, and then by the operator e to the ith. And then this u of t over here, that this e to the ith is actually, uh, we'll denote it as ut, and it's actually what we call a unitary operator. So if, you, if you're not so familiar with unbounded operators, um, if, if you can think of taking a unitary matrix on MNC, and then when we talk about a unitary operator, which is a general unbounded operator, then, no, that's actually always a bounded operator in B of H, then you can just think of that as a generalization of a unitary matrix. It's an operator uh, in B of H where U star U is equal to one. So the adjoint of U multiplied by U is equal to one. So in other words, what you've got is that the dynamics um, if, you, if you've got a, a state, let's say, which is phi, how will that state evolve over time? Then it's just, you, you just apply the unitary operator U of T to that. Later on, I'm going to come back to this here. This is what we call, this is actually referred to as a group of automorphisms of the, um, of the observables. And we notice here that this is actually just u of t all star here. So that you've got here u of t all star a u of t. Okay, now you might think, what will this have to do with topological algebras and algebras and topological vector spaces and what I mentioned, what I mentioned earlier? Um, what we've got here is that, that this is actually the Hilbert space formalism or formulation of quantum mechanics. So this formalism is dependent on the Hilbert space that you are working with. Also, well, one thing I should mention is that for an operator observable with a discrete spectrum, a Hilbert space is generally sufficient for representing the observables as an unbounded operator on a Hilbert space. So you just take the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues. But then the moment you, you take an operator observable with a continuous spectrum, then a Hilbert space is not large enough to, to contain all the states. But what you actually have to do is you need to enlarge the Hilbert space to what we call a rigged Hilbert space. So that means that some way H has to sit in between uh, let's say an inner product space D, and then over here, what we call the conjugate space of D, which is all the, um, the, the, the sesquilinear forms which act on D. All right, now I'm not really, I'm, I'm very rarely going to be using rigged Hilbert space in this talk. I might only mention it once further on down, but you can just think of it as an extension of a Hilbert space, whereby you add more room to a Hilbert space in which, uh, to, in which to cater for operator observables having a continuous spectrum.
that's why I mentioned this, but otherwise I will only mention it once briefly a little bit later on in this talk. Okay, um, also something that you might have seen in previous talks uh, for Nethex, but again, I'll revise it here. One often takes the set of observables to be self-adjoint elements of a non-commutative C-star algebra. Again, in case you, you don't know what a C-star algebra is, it's just meant a star algebra. So a star algebra, which I've talked about previously, an algebra with an involution, which is equipped with a norm, and in such a way that the norm has this property here uh, for every x. And of course, the algebra is complete with respect to the metric, which is defined by this exact same norm. But now the metric has the star quadratic property there. Uh, you can think of that star quadratic property. It's like you take the complex conjugate of a complex number. It has this property. Or um, if you take a bounded linear operator on a Hilbert space, if X is a bounded linear operator on a Hilbert space, it will certainly have this property so that B of H is an example of a C star algebra. In fact, all norm closed sub star sub algebras of B of H are C star. Um, also, what you might recall from previous talks, C star algebras, they come actually with an abundance of um, positive linear functionals and a uh, unital which represent the states. So those actually are functionals where um, that is, if I take f of x star x, then I get something which is bigger or equal to zero for all x in x. And f of the identity element one is one, that also. I will be coming back to that a little bit later on again in this talk. And then every C star algebra you can actually represent as a norm closed star sub algebra of some B of H. In other words, the norm, these norm closed star sub algebras are in fact all the, 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 the C star algebras. And this uses the GNS construction, which I'll talk about again later. And then the self-adjoint bounded linear operators would constitute the observables of the quantum system under consideration. Uh, now there's actually only one problem generally that if you, for example, look at Schrodinger's theory, uh, those operators are generally not bounded. So one cannot really use a C star algebra to model the observables unless you want to reformulate the Heisenberg commutation relation in terms of the vowel commutation relations, for those of you familiar with that. Okay, so what then do we need? What then do we do with observables which are not bounded? How are we to work with them? One thing that one can do is one can represent observables instead as self-adjoint elements of a non-commutative locally convex star algebra with identity. And I will explain shortly what I mean by that. And by self-adjoint, I mean an operator, an element which equals its own uh, X star. And the states of the quantum system are generally positive linear functionals. So the, where the identity um, element gets mapped to the scalar one. And by positive linear functional, we mean this, and I will explain it shortly again, just to emphasize it. Oh, sorry. And then the time dynamics of the quantum system is represented by a one parameter group of star automorphisms. So um, that we've already seen, a star automorphism of an algebra, first of all, it is a homomorphism, which takes you from the algebra to itself. It's a homomorphism, first of all. 
which is bijective. So in other words, one-to-one -one and onto, and which respects, uh, which does respect the, the involution for all X. Okay, so now what do I mean by a locally convex star algebra and a positive linear functional? So in order to explain that, now to motivate those concepts, I first need to tell you what's a topological algebra. It's an algebra which is housed of topological vector space in which the multiplication is only separately continuous. That means, for example, A goes to AX, X goes to uh, XA are continuous. And that's now where the element A is taken to be fixed. It's not jointly continuous like for addition. A topological star algebra, that's a topological algebra equipped with a continuous involution. And then a locally convex star algebra is any topological star algebra. So that means topological algebra with continuous involution, which is also what we call a locally convex topological space. So that's where you've got that the base, the neighborhood base of zero, con, uh, there's a neighborhood base of zero um, consisting of convex sets. And then lastly, a fresher algebra, that's any topological algebra, which is a complete, which is also a complete metric space. Okay, so that's what a locally convex star algebra is. And also you can think of a normed space. A normed space is an example of a locally convex space. So because our operator observables are generally unbounded, we have to look elsewhere we, beyond the bounded operators to see where they could actually fit in. And locally convex star algebras will be, uh, um, is, one, is one such avenue. Again, what's a positive linear functional? Any linear functional, so that when you apply x star x to it for any x, you get something which is either zero or larger than zero. And then a state, anything where any positive linear functional mapping the identity to one. Okay, now comes the question. What type of locally convex star algebras can we take to house the observables? Locally con convex star algebras are still rather very general. Okay, so what one would want in such an algebra is something which has a lot in common with the C star algebra, namely representations and states. There can be locally convex star algebras which have no representations and no positive linear functionals. And they, are, and they can be very badly behaved as far as C star algebras they can be very far removed from C star algebras. So we need something which behaves more like a C star algebra where we have all these nice things in which to do our, our quantum mechanics. So one way maybe of doing it could be these generalized B star algebras. Okay, so what do I mean by a generalized B star algebra? This is a concept which, which goes back to, to Graham Allen in 1967. And then um, uh, Peter Dixon uh, took up the study further at around 1970, in which he derived some further properties. And then, of, and then, and then many, and then some other papers, some other papers have been have been published over the decades. So the whole topic, up until now, was scattered just across various journal articles. And recently, myself. Uh, Mar and Maria Fragolopoulou and um, Atsushi in Norway and Ioana Zarakas, we recently published a book on this topic. And I'll tell you more about it at the end of the talk. So what do we mean by generalized B star algebra? It's any, it's any locally convex star algebra, topological star algebra, which is locally convex and which is what we call pseudo complete. For the purposes of this talk, you only have to know that a pseudo-complete algebra is a, is, a, is a weaker form of completeness. 
not as strong as complete. And A tau is a generalized B star algebra, or we call it GB star algebra for short. If A has a star subalgebra, AB zero, which contains the identity. So AB zero is contained in A, and this AB zero is itself a star algebra. When you restrict the addition, the scalar multiplication and the multiplication to AB zero. First of all, now the AB zero must be a C star algebra in some norm. That's the first thing. And then secondly, the symmetry condition holds that one plus X star X inverse always exists. And it must be within that C star algebra AB zero uh, for any X in A. And lastly, when you take the closed unit ball of the C star algebra, then it must be a closed subset of A in the topology, in the topology tau. So when all of those conditions are met, then we call this thing a GB star algebra. You can actually think of a, a GB star algebra or generalized B star algebra as a, as a C star algebra in which you enlarge it by chucking in or throwing in some unbounded, um, some unbounded elements, so to speak. A C star algebra is associated with bounded linear operators on a Hilbert space. So now you enlarge that structure by chucking in inverted commas, unbounded elements, and those unbounded elements are actually unbounded operators on a Hilbert space. So here's that. This is how you can actually intuitively think of a generalized B star algebra, and I'll give some examples shortly. One thing, though, is that if you take a GB star algebra, and this result goes back to but, then that C star algebra AB0, which I spoke about here, is in fact dense in the algebra. What this means is that if you take the closure, or the, if I take the smallest closed set to contain AB0, then um, this is the smallest closed set to contain AB0. It must in fact be the whole A. Okay, for some examples, so that this is one way you can think of it. Just think of it as a C star algebra. It contains a C star algebra, which is dense. And you're thinking of it, you're, you're thinking of, you're just looking at an enlargement of the C star algebra so that you still get a locally convex topological star algebra structure from it. One example, Complete pro C star algebras or pro C star algebras, any complete locally convex star algebra for which the topology is defined by a directed family of C star seminorms. These are all seminorms having this property. So it's like the C star norm, the C star norm that we had back then, but now the seminorms have the property. And C of X in the compact open topology where X is completely regular, that's an example. And if you now take the intersection of all LP spaces, let's say on zero one, then this, is, this turns out to be a Frechet GB star algebra, but it's not a pro C star algebra. So it's quite far removed from a C star algebra, but there is a C star algebra dense inside it. The C star algebra, which is dense in here, is actually the L infinity space. So that's all the equivalence classes of um, essentially bounded measurable functions on zero one, complex valued. And every unital closed star subalgebra of a GB star algebra is again a GB star algebra. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, were more familiar with unbounded operators or with non-commutative analysis, um, there are various star algebras of measurable operators which are affiliated with the von Neumann algebra, and they actually actually also turn out to be GB star. 
but um, not necessarily locally convex though, because Dixon, what Dixon did in 1970 or so was to remove the restriction of local convexity on a GB star algebra so that all the measurable operators affiliated with the von Neumann algebra can be accommodated. But for our purposes, they will be locally convex in the, in the original, uh, in our original definition. Also, GB star algebras for which the underlying C star algebra AB0 is a W star algebra or an abstract von Neumann algebra, they are actually quite intimately connected with what is, what is called an unbounded Hilbert algebra or extended W star algebras. And these actually consist of algebras of unbounded operators. And uh, okay, something about unbounded star representations. If you take a locally convex star algebra, then an unbounded star representation of A is any star homomorphism, uh, which, which you can define on A and which maps into what we call this L dagger D. Those are all closable operators which map D to D and also for which T star maps D to D. So D is an inner product space. So in other words, it's just an inner product space. So it's equipped with an inner product. It need not be complete. And then this gives rise to a positive linear functional. Every star representation will give rise to a positive linear functional. So you take pi, let's say, of x, take that x, put it here, and then you take the you, you apply c to that, and then take the inner product to c. And this turns out to be positive linear functional. The GNS construction uh, for C star algebras does carry over to locally convex star algebras. I remember I've seen also this construct this construction mentioned in previous talks, but nevertheless, I'll go through it again. But now um, this, the same idea carries through to locally convex star algebras verbatim. Um, we will let, if we take a positive linear functional, what can we do with it? We can define a left ideal on A, which is all X in A, the set of all X in A, so that when you take X star X and you plug it into the functional, you get something which is zero. And also then you can define an inner product on the quotient space, it, um, on this quotient space A modulo N phi. So that's just what you, well, what you get when you take phi and you, and you apply to Y star X. And um, this definition does not depend on, on the equivalence class under which we are working by the very definition of N phi. So it's not dependent on how this equivalence class is represented by X and Y. And one can define an unbounded star representation going from A to L plus D of phi, D of phi being that space, that inner product space. All you do is you take pi phi of X when you apply to Y plus N phi, then it's just X times Y plus N phi. So it's an operator then which takes you from um, A mod N phi all the way to A modulo N phi. And then we say that pi of phi above over here, this representation is a, is a GNS representation of A associated with that positive linear functional phi. So what do you... What we have for C star algebras, it does carry through verbatim to the locally convex star case. And then um, one thing one can easily check is that the, the representation pi phi will directly define the original positive linear functional we started off with in this particular manner. And then also what I thought I mentioned just for noting, just to give you a better feel for it, um, is that for any GB star algebra, there's always a faithful star representation. 
um, on the GB star algebra. And that turns out that faithful representation turns out to be the direct sum of all these uh, GNS representations over the states phi. The same result, this is, the, this is exactly why a C star algebra can be represented as a norm closed star sub algebra of some B of H. And now the same thing holds for a GB star algebra. But now instead, you, you have to work with unbounded operators generally and not bounded operators. So one can actually therefore think of a GB star algebra as an unbounded operator in disguise. You take a C star algebra, therefore, consisting of bounded operators, and you make it bigger by chucking in some unbounded operators on the Hilbert space. Okay, uh, now what I want to start discussing just briefly is something on the joint systems. So I'm just going to quickly give you a reminder on, um, on the tensor product, the algebraic tensor product of two vector spaces V and W. It's that vector space along with the bilinear form, bilinear form, which I'm going to denote in this way with the cross and circled which takes you from the Cartesian product of V and W into um, the algebraic tensor product. Okay, so um, it's that bilinear form such that for every other vector space Z, I'll make a diagram here. For every other vector space Z, And for every other uh, bilinear map, which is defined on V, then there's a unique bilinear form, which takes you from that space down to Z. In such a way that this diagram commutes. So uh, it's defined in such a way that for every Z and every H, you can get this bilinear form over here, which makes the diagram commute. And um, this property is unique up to isomorphism, so that this space here is therefore uniquely determined up to vector space isomorphism, so that this makes sense. Also, one, can, uh, one of the things that um, I looked at uh, with my collaborators, I started looking at when I, was, when I did my postdoc at the University of Athens in Greece, um, we started looking at tensor products of GB star algebras. So um, the tensor product, what we do is we, we first form the algebraic tensor product of A1 and A2, as on the previous slide. We remember that both of these things are vector spaces. And we equip it with some locally convex star topology, making the multiplication jointly continuous, not only separately. When the multiplication here is jointly continuous, then when you take the completion of that, or just the smallest complete um, space which contains this algebraic tensor product, which is that, um, then one necessarily gets again a topological algebra, but you need the jointly continuous multiplication for that. And then uh, the completion must be a GB star algebra. And then there's a C star cross norm um, on the underlying, on the two underlying C star algebras of these two GB star algebras, uh, such that it is first of all contained in the completion and such a way that the norm here is actually stronger than the topology tau on the, uh, on the on this uh, on that GB star algebra. So, in other words, that 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 completion of the algebraic tensor product of a GB star algebra, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a GB star algebra provided that this condition two is fulfilled. So that's one of the results which we proved. Okay, now what does this have to do with joint systems? And for Neumann's formalism of quantum mechanics, we actually associate Hilbert spaces H1 and H2 with the states of two quantum systems, Q1 and Q2 respectively. 
Then to consider the joint system of Q1 and Q2, what we then look at is the Hilbert space tensor product, which is associated with the states of Q1 and Q2. So you take the Hilbert space tensor product uh, so that you again get a Hilbert space. And then a separable state uh, for the joint system of Q1 and Q2 will therefore be a state or a vector in the Hilbert space completion having a norm one. And it is something which is just an elementary tensor of H1 and H2. And then an entangled state for the joint system, it will be a state in inside the Hilbert space completion of H1 and H2, which is not separable. In other words, which is not an elementary tensor, not of this form over here. Okay, now we want to switch over to topological algebras so that uh, we can get a, a representation which is free of the Hilbert space. Um, if we now take two GB star algebras and we and we which represent two quantum systems of Q1 and Q2 respectively, then one can represent the observables in the joint system of Q1 and Q2 as self-adjoint elements of some kind of complete tensor product GB star algebra. So in other words, we assume that this thing is indeed a GB star algebra, that the conditions are met, as in the previous system. So now instead of having the Hilbert space tensor product, we have now a tensor product, which is a, a uh, which is a, again a GB star algebra, which is assumed to be the, um, the, the GB star tensor product of two, um, of two algebras. In this case, locally convex. Uh, it would be very nice if one, if there's no ambiguity in how many ways one can form the joint system. So one would actually only like to have uh, one, one topology tau, which makes um, we, from, you would only want to have one way in which you can form the completion. So the way one can do this is in what we call a linearly, what, what we call with linearly nuclear GB star algebras. Those are locally, those we can think of as um, topological vector spaces, which are both nuclear as, lo as locally convex spaces. So nuclear, locally, linearly nuclear GB star algebras will then be nuclear locally, will then be nuclear as locally convex spaces. And then any inverse limit of a finite dimensional C star algebra that you can think of as a linearly nuclear pro C star algebra and hence a linearly nuclear GB star algebra. Okay, representing a quantum system as a linearly nuclear GB star algebra can also be seen as a correct choice in light of the following observations. Not only in that you can form, the, not only in that there's only one way to form the, the, the tensor product, that there's no ambiguity as to what topology we take, but also that any fresh A linearly nuclear GB star algebra you can actually represent as an O star algebra of unbounded operators on a Richt Hilbert space. So that's the only place now where I mentioned Richt Hilbert space, so that you can cater for all the states. Also, those which are not, which you cannot necessarily fit inside the Hilbert space. Also, any linearly nuclear GB star algebra will have an abundance of pure states, which are definitely essential uh, in uh, quantum mechanics. And this comes from a theorem of Bochers, Ingvarsson, and Hegerfeld. So, another good reason, again, for taking those. Okay, now we come to the definition of quantum entanglement, the very first definition. So uh, here we take two linearly nuclear GB star algebra, and we assume that this thing does form a GB star algebra under some topology. 
that we, okay, so that we get a linearly nuclear GB star algebra, then we let phi over here be a state on A, then there is a representation uh, pi going from A to L plus D, uh, so that when you apply phi to um, finite sums of elementary tensors, uh, you can of course then take the summation out, it will become the sum of the inner products of those terms. And then we will say that phi on A is a separable state if the, if the, if the star representation pi above can be chosen so that this C that we see written here is actually an elementary tensor. So this then can be done. But now the question is how can we, if the C makes, uh, has all the right properties that it can be written as an elementary tensor, then we call it a separable state. And this definition was motivated by uh, the way in which we think of a separable state in the Hilbert space formalism, namely as a tensor product, as an elementary tensor uh, of two um, vectors of norm one. And then we will say that the state phi is entangled if it is not a separable state. In other words, you can't write it. In other words, if the C that you get here cannot be written as an elementary tensor. One problem though with this definition is it's now becoming dependent on how you actually represent your tensor product algebra as an algebra of unbounded operators on a Hilbert space. It's dependent exactly on how that's done. So to free ourselves from that, a second definition is probably more applicable in that if you take two GB star algebras, again, for which this is a, um, a GB star tensor product, then we say phi is separable if you can write it as a tensor of two states. So in other words, phi of x tensor y, this then is phi 1x tensor phi 2x, phi 2y, whenever x is in A1, and y is in A2. The, the, the one nice thing about this definition is that um, it's much more agreeable uh, with, the, with the concept of independence in probability theory. It's much more agreeable with that, but now due to time constraints, I cannot, I cannot go into the reasons why, but you can go and look at you can go and look it up in the in the in my published paper. So that's another reason why, another good reason for choosing this definition. And then an entangled state phi is a state which is not separable in the sense. In other words, it's a state which cannot be written in this way. Okay, um, the, this previous definition actually motivates, uh, what do we know about, about pure states of a GB star algebra? especially the pure states are relevant to quantum mechanics. So then also in the same paper, I managed to prove some results about pure states of GB star algebras um, to try and, and especially ascertain when they are entangled and when they are when and when not. So a state on a GB star algebra is a pure state if for any positive linear functional C, which is less than equal to phi, so in other words, the pure state is referred to that phi over here. You can always write C as a scalar multiple of phi. That's now for any state which is less than or equal to phi. Then this phi over here is what we call a pure state. Every C star algebra has an abundance of pure state um, and there can be GB star algebras having no pure states. And then a linearly nuclear GB star algebra has at least one pure state by the theorem of Bochas and Ingvarsson and Hegerfeld, which I mentioned previously. Okay, now I'm coming very, very close to the end of my talk. Uh, using all those results about pure states in my paper, which I've got no time to go into, one can show that if you take two non-commutative Frechet GB star algebras, Non-commutativity is what we want in quantum mechanics. 
and such that you've got irreducible star representations, which are which have the property of what we call separating its points. Uh, then this GB star tensor product or joint system of the two. Um, if we also assume that the joint system has um, has the property here, this is A, that the underlying C star algebra of this tensor product is just the um, the the C star tensor product of the two underlying C star algebras corresponding to those two, then this is this will definitely admit at least one entangled pure state. But now in the sense of the second definition, which I had previously, in the sense of the second definition. All the conditions in this corollary are satisfied for a C star algebra, but not necessarily so for um, an arbitrary Frechet GB star algebra. So one has to impose all those conditions. Okay, so the, um, then I will just end here um, by just mentioning again the main reference here from which you can, the paper in which I published and everything. And then also just some general references here uh, by the, especially the original reference of Allen and Dixon, and then um, a published paper by, my, uh, by Maria Fragolopoulou and, and Atsushi in Norway, in which we initiated the study. Lastly, um, Myself, Atsushi in Norway, Maria Fragolopoulou, and um, Ioana Zarakas, we recently uh, gotten a book published on generalized B star algebras and applications. So, all the results are mentioned in this talk, and the results of Allen and Dixon uh, you can certainly find in this book. And it's published by uh, Springer uh, Lecture Note Series in Mathematics. Um, this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, thank you all very, very much for your, uh, your attendance. Um, if, if, are there any questions? Yeah, Martin, thank you very much for, for your talk. It was really very interesting. Thank you so much.